on today's episode, ammonia as jet fuel? It seems crazy to me. Today's episode is brought to you by engineering.com, a globally trusted source for engineering content. Check out this and many other exclusive videos for the engineering professional found only on engineering.com TV today. At the recent United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP26, held in Glasgow, Scotland, the participating nations reiterated their goal for net zero carbon emissions by 2050 and added support for some industry-specific initiatives, including aviation. Now, for that industry, the ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, is now the agreed managing body for international carbon reduction schemes, as well as for the development of sustainable aviation fuels. Now, up to now, drop-in replacements for aviation-grade kerosene, like Jet-A, have been bio-derived kerosene analogs, so it's not surprising that they perform as well as petroleum-derived fuels in turbine engines. But the global aviation industry consumes well over 5 million barrels per day of jet fuel, and replacing that kind of quantity isn't going to happen from biological sources. Now, right now, a major source of interest is ammonia as an alternate fuel. There's plenty of research activity in ammonia as a fuel generally, and with good reason. Ammonia is almost 18% hydrogen by mass, and it can be made from renewable hydrogen with nitrogen sourced from the air. There's a huge industry already dedicated to manufacturing it as a fertilizer, chemical feedstock, and a refrigerant, and there's an efficient transportation infrastructure to move it around. Now, that's all good, but there are several problems as well. Low flammability is one which is a serious problem if you're burning it in a jet engine, and a lot of the research is focused on pre-mixed and counterflow flame strategies and sophisticated swirl burner technologies that can support stable burning in jet engine combustors. And there's another problem. All that useful hydrogen is bound to nitrogen, and at the kinds of combustion temperatures that make efficient jet engines, it binds with oxygen to produce nitrogen oxides, a major contributor to photochemical smog. And unlike automotive piston engines, urea after treatment of the exhaust stream is not possible in aviation. Now, handling this stuff is another factor. It's very toxic, and in all but the coldest sub-zero conditions, it exists as a gas and is a serious inhalation risk. For transportation in pipelines or in railroad or tank cars, ammonia is refrigerated or more commonly liquefied by pressure. A railroad tank car is typically pressurized to 125 PSI for this purpose. Now, a Boeing 777, for example, might carry 180,000 liters, or 47,000 gallons of fuel, distributed between a center tank and left and right wing tanks. These, of course, are not pressurized, and if it's necessary to apply 125 PSI to keep ammonia fuel liquid, that tankage will have to be either cylindrical or spherical, or use some advanced internal support structure, possibly 3D printed. And, of course, the tanks must be vented, which is effectively a toxic gas leak source. Then there's the question of what happens during an emergency fuel dump. Does an emergency aircraft simply dump tens of thousands of gallons of liquid ammonia to flash to gas in the atmosphere? Now, I'm not saying that these technical challenges can't be overcome, but the entire point of the exercise is to prevent CO2 emissions. Kerosene is an incredibly efficient and energy-dense fuel source, and as a liquid at normal atmospheric pressures and temperatures, it's very unlikely that any gaseous fuel source will make sense in large aircraft applications. The goal is zero CO2, not necessarily zero CO2 from every individual source. Now, it seems to me that a more sensible solution would be to simply remediate the CO2 emissions from aircraft by pulling it out of the atmosphere and sequestering it, something that has been demonstrated on a commercial scale for some time. Now, there's lots of money sloshing around the world for research on advanced alternate fuel technologies, but if I were to choose a fuel to power jet engines, I'm skeptical that a fuel that's toxic, difficult to store, and difficult to ignite is going to be a practical solution. If you ask me, and certainly no one has, we should just take the CO2 out elsewhere. Well, that's it for today's episode of End of the Line, brought to you by engineering.com. If you like this show, be sure to subscribe to our channel and click on the notification bell for our next episode. For our deeper engineering video series for the manufacturing professional, visit engineering.com TV to watch exclusive shows like Manufacturing the Future, not found here on our YouTube channel. The link is in the description below. Thanks for watching.